SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Ken is a passionate agro innovator. His love for agriculture stems from endless summer spent on his grandparents' farm in Coaldale, and he loved it so much that he quite literally bought the farm. This is where he's raising his three boys with his wife Dana. He has Alex, who's 13, Carter's 11, and Jackson's 9. This small farm keeps Ken active, and he continues his experiments with subsurface drip irrigation and a new venture with 10 acres of willows. And if I had a dime for every time I heard about these willows and didn't know what he was talking about, I'd at least have a full tank of gas at this point. In all seriousness, though, Ken is an impressive agricultural guru. His career spans 25 years in agricultural research and extension in private industry, government, and most recently with the nonprofit charity Farming Smarter. Ken has built Farming Smarter into a world-class agricultural innovation hub and built an even more impressive team to help guide future egg practices and innovation research-based evidence Ken believes strongly that these regionally focused groups are essential to ensure that farms remain competitive and resilient. Ken is a 2022 Nuffield Scholar and is studying producer-focused organizations around the world with 10 weeks to travel and plans to share the best organizational practices and approaches with Canadian groups. I promise you, you're in for a treat. Um, it's not just farm talk, and Ken does have the gift of the gab, but he's very wise and very funny, so please welcome Ken Coles. You, you, you call me lovely and wise. <laughs> Gift of the gab, yeah. I was going to start off by telling you all that I'm actually an introvert, but I like talking about agriculture. So <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and share some of my experiences and have a bit of a good conversation. I know I'm getting drawn into a bit of a political debate, but the nice thing about um, anything that gives us an excuse to talk about agriculture and then we'll shift it over to what really matters. Um, so it's good to be in the news. I think we're in the news for the wrong reasons, but uh, we'll find out how it goes. So I'm going to tell you, talk to you a little bit about Farming Smarter, just about who we are, what we do, some of the highlights that we have. I see I have some issues with the presentation not working as well it should. I'll explain the Nuffield Scholarship and what that whole organization is about because it's pretty cool. We can talk a little bit about the ag policies and I'll save as much time as possible for the conversation. I've been to a few of these in the past and I know how eager you guys are to engage in questions, especially these two over here. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll make sure I leave enough time for that. So we're created by farmers and for farmers. We actually are a nonprofit organization. We have our charitable status as an educational institution. Uh, the, the motto that we live by is we change the way people farm. And we focus on the innovators. And those are the farmers that are always constantly pushing the envelope, trying out new ideas, trying new farming practices, technology. So we're there to really facilitate that. And the theory behind that is if we work with the innovators, we're going to pull the whole industry forward. We only have limited resources, and it seems kind of just logical to work with those that want to work with us. For timeline wise, our organizations were uh, first created in the early 1990s, 1990 and 94 for Southern Applied Research Association and the Southern Alberta Conservation Association. One group was applied research focused, the other group was really built to help with the transition towards zero tillage. So a lot of soil conservation efforts, uh, a big conference that was there uh, looking at equipment on how to adapt into this new farming approach that was sort of direct seeding and zero tillage and moving away from conventional tillage and wheat fallow type rotations. Uh, we got a chunk of land from the Lethbridge College in 2005, which somebody grew weeds for two years until I took over in 2007. 
and then it took me five years to get the weeds under control. So I've been there for about 15 years now, and it's been very exciting to be part of it sort of from the beginning. I was, it was a kind of a small organization, maybe one person for many, many years. And then we partnered with as many people as we could, Alberta Agriculture, I know there's some retired Ag Canada scientists here, all great partners in the work that, that we did that sort of got us up and going. And government kind of just keeps cutting back their support for agriculture. And that's been going on for a long, long time. And I think it's sort of, you know, farmers are doing a good job. They don't need the support. So now it's time for you guys to figure out things on your own. However, I would contend that some of the crises that we are in or, or debates that we're in are, are because of that uh, reduction in people. There's just less people involved in agriculture. And I would say that the government doesn't have a great relationship with farmers. And maybe with everyone, who knows. But that's a big challenge that, that we've sort of lost the connection and this great system that we had is now gone and now we're trying to clean up the mess with bigger problems and bigger challenges. So 2012 we officially amalgamated these two groups into Farming Smarter and we had a magazine, uh, Claudette's here with us, she actually was the editor of the magazine I think before I even started and we just thought it was such a great name. The magazine was called Farming Smarter so we just changed the name of the organization to that and the rest is history. 2020, we, uh, we sort of rebranded and re-looked at how we were doing our business. And uh, this year is actually our 10th anniversary as being Farming Smarter. So we've been trying to celebrate as much as possible. We went in the parade this year and we've got a gala coming up uh, in November to sort of celebrate the, the efforts that have been done collectively over the years. And 2023 moving forward, there's a lot of uncertainty. We're coming through uh, a new ag policy framework, which is from the federal government. And we know that there's a lot of climate change focus, so we'll see how things go. Our organization is a policy governed group. So we have a board of directors that used to be all farmers, but we wanted to diversify our board and have a lot of different expertise. That's one of the reasons Mandy is on our board, who knows nothing about agriculture, and every time she talks, she proves it. <laughs> Just kidding. She's been a delightful addition uh, to our board, and her expertise in board governance and str strategic planning has been very valuable. So we, we have a majority farmers on the board to make sure that we still maintain that connection with the farms, but we're diversifying with consultants. Um, we recently had a, a real estate or, uh, of land real estate person, just different groups so that we have better ideas and better focus. So within that, they've, dis they've sort of charted the path of the organization. My you know, first one, believe it or not, is build a stable and growing resource base. So that's the number one strategic goal. In order for us to help farmers, we need to have the resources to do a good job. We need to be able to attract talented and skilled individuals to be able to service a very demanding industry. Uh, we want to enhance the, the recognized value, so the brand of Farming Smarter. And then the meat of what we do is delivering high quality research, uh, develop innovation. There is a difference between research and innovation. Um, and then we're going to do that through small plot field tested, small plot research. The, for, the fourth goal is field tested. So that's going out onto the farms and adapting and helping the farmers adopt the new practices and technologies that are out there. Uh, the fifth one is we want to be a leading a custom research organization. So a lot of our business is actually working with industry. So we'll work with uh, chemical companies and seed companies and test biostimulants and all the different rage that's out there. So we get locally tested third party um, data on products and practices that are coming within the industry. That's a really great thing for us because it makes us still maintains a great connection with industry even though we're still focused on the farm. And we want to be uh, Alberta's leading agronomy network. So this is the training and the extension component. So we want to be the spot where people come to learn and talk and have conversations about farming and farming practices. So then my job as the executive director is to achieve those goals. And in order to do that, that's what we we're talking about, designing business units for our organization. So we've got an agronomy research program where we both lead research projects and partner with lots of other groups like universities, uh, Inatech Alberta, colleges and other groups like ours across the country. 
the field tested program I mentioned and our custom research program and the extension. Extension is just a, an, actually an older word that I don't want to let go of. That means um, we're going to extend the information that we learn, but it's more than just say handing over a, a, a tech sheet. It's about relationships with the farmers, being out there and almost being cheerleaders in the industry. This is our team this year, and we've, we've grown quite a bit uh, from just a couple of people 15 years ago. We had, I think, 28 staff this year and 15 summer students, so that brings a lot of great experience. One of the most rewarding things for us is actually we're hiring students, and they fall in love with agriculture. And a lot of these kids end up wanting to either work with us or go into ag industry, even if they're not in agriculture. And I think that's, that's an important thing to remember, that we're not attracting enough bright minds into this industry, and we need to figure out how to continue to do that. So it's been a great crew. We only trampled about you know a tenth of an acre for the pitcher. It's all good. So we're working on 160 projects this year and over 3,000 acres, that's including the field tested projects. We're partnered with 60 industry organizations, 31 research institutions, and we make sure that we have as much visitors to our facilities as possible. We put on tours, field schools, and so on. So we had 12 events this year with about 1,400 attendees. And we do try to evaluate the economic impact and the number that we share is ridiculous it's 129 million but uh, it's important for us as we're trying to secure uh, support for our core activities which is becoming more and more challenging and everybody seems to like economic so we, we keep on a, on that analysis this last year our custom research program grew by you know just amazing amounts so we have a large a large program and I think a lot of the industry folks just needed to get back in the field so the COVID, I think that's a that's a bit of a COVID thing but we're gonna see if we can maintain those efforts because any of the money we sort of make off of custom work we can turn around and leverage back into government grants so I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about Nuffield uh, I actually applied for this scholarship mostly out of frustration and in my career and you know we're banging our heads against the walls of you know we built this great organization that we feel has a lot of impact, yet we're failing to secure the funds to keep it running the way we want to run it. And this was an opportunity to go around and, and look at what's happening in other parts of the world. So we, I applied for that and received it. It's based out of the UK, and, and it is really like joining a family of crazy ag enthusiasts around the world. So it's a great networking opportunity. There's people working in all kinds of projects and it's almost become a bit of a support group for, for, for me and, and reinvigorated my passion for what we do because it is sort of a thankless job at times. You work really hard and it doesn't seem to garner the support that you think it should. So um, I'm, I'm happy that it's, it's reinvigorated um, my passion because otherwise, I'd, well, I'd be sad. So I was asked to present agriculture in Canada to this group of scholars. There was 143 of schol scholars from around the world, and they wanted me to do it in five minutes. And I was like, wow, agriculture in Canada in five minutes. So I, I'm going to share with you one slide just because um, it brings into context some of the challenges we're faced with in, in agriculture in Canada. And it's that our country is really big. Um, I found this website where I could play kind of Tetris with countries and I was able to take every country in Europe and overlay it onto Canada. So you think about how we manage our agriculture, how we manage our ag policies and we can fit every country in Europe. They all have separate uh, investments. When, we, when you look at the amount of investments in agriculture in all of these countries combined, it dwarfs what we're doing in agriculture. Yet we're one of the biggest ag exporters in the world. So I do think we've come into a bit of a situation where we pushed it a little bit too far that ag can take care of itself when southern Alberta is bigger than France. Like it's just, it puts things into perspective. So I mentioned that, uh, you know, agriculture is a pretty big deal. We all know that in Lethbridge and southern Alberta, but we're the fifth in global exports. 
And I think from what I've heard in the past, there's probably only six or seven countries that have the capacity to be net exporters of agricultural products. So that's a pretty big opportunity and burden put upon our country in the global economy. And Alberta is almost uh, the, mo the highest producing. Uh, we, we've switched spots with Ontario, but right now Ontario has a slight advantage in, in total net uh, gross um, revenues in agriculture. So. Are you know obviously a good amount of what happens is Alberta and Saskatchewan, and there's higher value crops in Ontario that keep that number up. So this was one slide that really caught my attention on my first trip overseas for the Nuffield Scholarship, and this is this really struck home for me, and it's part of why we're having the conversations today. The European strategy, farm to fork, uh, it's really really ambitious and they want to they, they, they want to transition to use a quarter of their land in organic production and they want to reduce chemicals by half they want to reduce antibiotics by half and they want to reduce fertilizer use by 20 percent so what this means is they're paying their farmers to grow less and being in UK at this time with this collection of great minds right in the middle of the Ukraine crisis was quite a stirring experience because you've, you've got all of Europe creating ag policies, convincing farmers to grow less. And then you've got this huge catastrophe going on that upset the entire global markets, followed by COVID where for the first time we saw empty shelves, they're scrambling to change their ag policies. So that was a bit of a wake-up call. And then I hear news, like we've talked about, that we've got policies that are pointing in that same direction. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and I know that's what a lot of people would like to ask questions about, but European policies when it comes to agriculture, honestly, are, are, are somewhat terrifying. And I, I'm, I'm all for the environment. I took my master's in environment and management. That's what we'd like to do. So as part of this trip, I started off with a little visit in Scotland. And that dish to the left, does anybody know what that is? Haggis. Haggis. Doesn't look as bad as you think, eh? I absolutely loved haggis. I had it four times when I was in Scotland, only there for two days. So um, <laughs> it was delicious, yes. Sounds disgusting, but it was delicious. But food, right? It's, it's important. It's what connects our cultures, and it was really what I was studying. While I was there, though, um, I was really excited to meet with this group of, called Innovative Farmers. And they were actually very much focused on working at the farm level, like my, our field tested program does. And she said the funding was amazing for it. So they don't have that same issue. They're getting supported up the yin yang. And then when I looked to see the types of project they were doing, I actually thought there was lacking a lot of scientific rigor. So on the flip side, they have, the, that, that's become a sexy thing over there. And for some reason here, when you try to do anything that's practical or on farm, there's no support for it. There's only support for sort of the peer reviewed science and even then, they're really pushing you into the climate change type environment. So that was exciting to see. I visited Stirling Castle and this is Robert the Bruce and you know William Wallace and Braveheart. This is where that all happened. And the reason I put it up there is because on the tour of the castle, we stopped at the, the, the chef's house and the tour guide mentioned that even in the 1100s when this was all going on, that there was an amazing um, exporting of agricultural products. So it was a kind of a royalty thing, right? Bringing in spices from, from China. And she talked a lot about all of the different food exchanges that went on a thousand years ago. So I know we talk about local food movements, but it was neat to see that even a thousand years ago, how important it was to look at trade around the world. Ironically, the movie wasn't filmed here, but I managed to visit where it was filmed, and it was filmed in Ireland. <coughs> so we're talking about food. You guys know what this is? Yeah, Yorkshire pudding, and I ate it in York, in Yorkshire. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool too. And there's a tradition of a Sunday roast there. So again, culture around food was pretty exciting to see. And for the most part, people have the perceptions of how foods were produced, but because of these sort of perturbed policies, 
there was a really bit of a disconnect even there between the farms and the farmers themselves had heard it so much they were almost convinced that what they were doing was wrong and that scares me this scares me as well so this is Holcomb Hall estate and this still exists in in the UK and it's almost like a feudal system lords and well I'll pass it off here here can't see it now sorry I don't know what happened on this but this is the eighth Earl of Leicester and he owns that whole estate I said it wrong who said it right Lester Lester great funny enough he he has some connections to Lethbridge he knows some people here and so the whole entire farm was an old estate and they still own it and now they're managing it by contracting it to other farmers or they're environmentalists so now they're telling the people that they've hired to farm the land the way they want to see it farmed whether they know anything about the science or the agriculture and that system was very prevalent in the UK and there's still bloodlines the lords are actually still in government so you pass it down inside so that's a bit of an eye-opener too so when you look at that um, system when we went to Ireland it was actually kind of neat too so I went to Ireland and they take their Guinness very seriously so did we until we had a sip <laughs> the Guinness was very good there I'm not gonna lie so Ireland was really neat they have this organization called Chagas and it is a 400 million pound or euro a year organization all focused on agriculture and they've got everything that our old system had and then some so back to the old DA days when we had all Alberta Agriculture and Ag Canada all working together and that was pretty amazing to see considering how small of a country it was and how little they actually produced and by the way they don't really farm potatoes in Ireland anymore that one was a shocker there's only 4,000 hectares of potatoes in Ireland it's all dairy this fella here John Spink was a scientist and he was from the UK where I had just come from he said he hated the ag policies so much there that he moved to Ireland and the picture on the right is another one of those big estates that used to be all the farm they fought the British away and now this is actually turned into a research center so the Chagas research centers are all on these old sort of lords and estates that used to used to be there 60 percent of farm income comes from what they call schemes so if they're being incentivized to do something and 60 percent of your revenue is there you don't really have much of a choice in what you do so that also scares me we don't have those types of subsidies in Canada but we're moving in that direction I met another fella John no what the heck was his name Oh Fogel or something like that anyways he was a, he's also a fellow Nuffield scholar and what I found interesting about him he runs they run a nonprofit but in Ireland there was almost no natural habitat left so he got super excited to find natural habitat and trees and things like that They're, the whole point is to reestablish some forests there's actually no natural forests left they can only find them in deep ravines and the agriculture has honestly destroyed the entire natural habitat in the entire country so when you come back to, you know when I live in Canada and know how expansive we are and the beautiful habitat that we have it was quite an eye-opener to see that that this was the case and you know he hates sheep sheep wrecked the countryside basically and he was like the typical environmentalist he was actually hippies type surfer guy but when you got him into these sort of forest environments he just lit up so his job now is to work with farmers and try to bring back some of those conservation lands so on the flip side I'm, I'm all for um, protecting what we have and not getting to this situation I feel like we're very blessed in Canada to have preserved a lot of our, our habitat so nat naturally most of Ireland is in dairy farming now and they they actually this is where environmental policies are kind of weird because they got rid of the quota system and within a year their dairy industry increased by 50 percent so almost about 95 percent of agriculture in Ireland is dairy and no longer um, the potatoes that I thought they were except for this one chicken farmer and uh, Alex Iver put me up and he raises free-range chickens but again you put a policy in place uh, thinking that that's a better way to raise something 
and then avian flu comes around and now they have to put stickers on their eggs that say they're barn eggs. So this is actually some of his eggs in the grocery store that he showed me. So that's the reason I bring these up is, is they're, they're all sort of policies that are affecting how farmers do business and then something comes in and changes everything. So avian flu changes everything. Here's your willows, and I put this slide in just for you. I was excited to go to Ireland because I heard they had this burgeoning willow production, and they did that for biomass production. So they would go in like with a oh, silage chopper, chop this stuff up and, and use it for fuel. Um, I'm growing it for environmental reclamation reasons, but when I got to Ireland, this is like one of the last fields left because it was again a policy that was incentivized, and all these farmers started growing willows, and they found out that it just wasn't economical. So it just disappears. So we have to be careful with our policies. And then I went to France. And this was actually uh, a friend of mine, Charles Le Cornet, Le Cornet. And he actually came here and worked for Farming Smarter, worked for Ag Canada for a couple of summers on an exchange for his degree program. So it was really cool to go back and visit some of these students that we've had over the years and to experience real tillage like I've never seen. I'm young enough that I didn't see plows in full force. That's all that happens in France. Because you can see in the background of this field being planted to sugar beets, they pulverize the land into powder. And environmentally speaking, that's not a great way to protect our soils. And, but it is a consequence of a policy that says reduce herbicides and pesticides indiscriminately by 50%. So France is very close to losing glyphosate and their farming systems are nowhere near as um, I find sustainable as ours. But we did get a research bug into him. So he's been testing things out and trying new things on his farm. And I found out that France actually has a lot of great support in agriculture, but what doesn't happen is they don't know each other and they don't talk to each other. So this is another student that came to work with us, Martin on the right, and this great complex of research. This is the first time they met. They actually look like they're kind of scared of each other. Um, so we have science going on in the field, but they don't go out and talk to farmers. And we have the same thing going on here now. So when you break that relationship connection, uh, you can be doing all the science and valuable work in the world. If it doesn't end up on the farm, then what's the point? So now they know each other. Um, they've actually been in contact since I visited them. So in one small way, I made a connection in French that they wouldn't have otherwise had. So um, they're now uh, trying to work together on projects. And that spot on the left there where the canola isn't looking good, well, they don't have seed treatments because of environmental pressures. The neonicotinoids, if you've heard of that on the news, comes up from time to time. And this is a group of farmers that just get together on their own, and they're trying to work on conservation. And I thought it was ironic because it was a fabulous group, but then I look at all of this soil just pulverized into a powder, thinking, man, you guys could be doing a better job taking care of your soils. And this is actually their idea of soil conservation, moving from a plow to what's called a high-speed disc. So that was progress for them. For us, we're like, come on, guys, what the heck's going on? That's what policies can do. And this is just the opportunity to stop at the university where we had these students. And I love that part of their program, that they send people abroad. It's kind of why this Nuffield experience has been good for me. It's forcing me out of my comfort zone. My area of comfort is in southern Alberta. I don't like to leave that much. Next week, I'm going to Zimbabwe. So that should be exciting, and uh, I'll be happy to share what I learn out that way. And I'll end with a picture of my great-grandparents. And they immigrated to Canada from the Ukraine and started farming in the Great Depression. So when we think about environmentalism, um, I think we have to always bring it back to the farm level. If we aren't there supporting the activities that they do, using the science as a tool to the best way that we can, helping improve production practices, that's what matters. And we can't just let politics influence what's happening here, because it's in our best interest. 
So with that, I'll thank you for your time and be happy to answer questions or have a conversation. Does anybody have any questions? You can come up this way. Just remember to say your name and you know the rules. <laughs> My name is uh, Mark Gettle, and in, uh, in agriculture, I think branding or labeling is so important. And uh, recently, we had labeling of eggs, you know, free range, caged, or whatnot. And another huge, important uh, uh, branding is organic. But the problem with organic is, is the fact that it's almost a religion, in my view, and it doesn't always make sense. And there's a tremendous amount that can be done from conventional farming to move towards organic, but that's just too expensive or makes no sense for a farmer to go organic because it's a huge jump. Now, years ago, I think it was the University of Winnipeg tried to come up with a new branding, a new label that would be like best farming practices or something. So therefore, there was incentive. There would be an incentivized, as you could say, for farmers to move and get that labels so they could put more effort into moving more towards sustainable and getting a premium price for the product. Is there such a movement now? Because I think it's so important. We have conventional, which makes no sense for farmers to move towards better practices because they don't get the return on investment versus organic, where they do get a return on investment, but it costs, and it's much, much more difficult to jump from one to the other. So is there a movement, I think, to get try and get a new branding? Sure. <coughs> You've re retired too, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. retired. <laughs> there is, and I don't like it. It's, it is the regenerative ag movement. And that's been, it's really a global phenomenon. And what you're talking about is the difference between, I think, ideology and <coughs> concrete practices. I, I actually believe I, I, I prefer organic because they have a defined set of principles. I'm not saying that I think everyone should farm organically, but as a, as a brand, um, at least we know what it means. Regenerative agriculture, uh, the premise is they're moving towards sustainable practices, but there's no definition. So it could mean I'm going to incorporate cattle with uh, my grains, or I'm going to try to test my soil and grow mixtures of crops and, and cover crops and that. So, you know, it is happening. And I, I, I have also learned a while back how important branding is, even for our own organization. I don't like to brag about what we do, but it's important for our brand. And it's important for what we do as an industry. So I, I agree with you. Um, uh, there is a movement called regenerative agriculture. I am also not too keen on the fact that it almost dismisses the conventional sustainable farmer um, and, and it doesn't mean anything. So it, it's open to too much interpretation. Like the Kiss the Ground documentaries on Netflix, I don't think really give a good um, representation of what sustainable agriculture is. There's a little group of farmers that are, are, are buying into the ideology of it, and but there's also no way of collecting any kind of uh, value-added, you know, piece like organic does either. So it, it's almost more as a political tool than anything. Um, a lot of times, given the certain government, if there's a collection of organizations that have branded themselves in that way, well, they get a government grant. Go do what you want, whether they represent all farmers or not. So the politics behind it are scary. I'm not sure I answered that, but like I told you, before at another meeting, we, we had a good conversation, right? <laughs> Do you have any follow-up to that? No, I would just say. <clears throat> yeah, you say exactly what the problem is. It's, this is no one set branding that has the rules and whatever. Look mm -hmm. at how long it took for ag organic to become mm -hmm. well established. All the rules are there. So. I'm just thinking if we had something like that that was accepted <clears throat> worldwide, because organic now is accepted pretty well worldwide. Yeah. So if we had a system where we could move a little bit, and then uh, when we buy something, we would at least know that this was done uh, following those standards. Okay. That, that's all. Yeah. But, but I understand what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I 
Hi. Hi, Ken. How are you? Fine. Good. Henning Mundel. So the time you started at SARA, I think, that's mm -hmm. the year I retired, 2007. Mm -hmm. So if a little bit of water has flown down the Old Man River since. Yes. And I first want to really congratulate you for that Nuffield Scholarship. Thank that you. is quite a coup that you're able to get that. I have two specific questions. One relates to the, to the interval the, from 2007 to now. Mm -hmm. um, how many of my colleagues at the research station, and which ones, are you or have you, because some of them have retired in the interim, yeah. been directly involved with? I assume Bob Blackshaw, but anyway. Um, and the other question, looking at your organizational structure, doesn't matter that you're bald, you don't need to wear a hat, you don't get to the fields. Not anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wrote about that. Um, yeah, no, we, we partner still heavily as much as we possibly can with Ag Canada. And yeah, Bob Blackshaw actually worked with us after he retired for a little bit. So that was exciting. We do have our own scientists now. And one of the things that we are trying to do is publish our work um, as much as possible. We've done that now. We're starting to publish. Um, it's not the main objective of our organization, but the, the quality control that it adds to the work that we do and the recognition of what we do on a more global scale is, is helping raise our profile. So it's a branding exercise while maintaining the focus on real, practical, adoptable information. I remember being in your office and we've worked, um, luckily there was a replacement for Bob, so there, there's, an uh, there's a new entomologist um, that's focused on cereals that we work with. I would say there's a probably seven or eight in total that we work with closely. Mm -hmm. But at one point, and, and actually not at one point, um, maybe somewhere around when you retired or not, Ag Canada was not allowed or directed to do any extension work. And that's been a real challenge. So what that means is they do the research, but you can't really go out and do much at the farm level, you know, even speaking, and it's, it, it's become a lot of red tape. But we need to be able to partner with the scientists, and we need to have scientists out of that big building and in farmers' fields developing relationships directly. And a lot of that has been discouraged over the time, and, and that's, that's a big problem. You know, that's, that's why I think a lot of the problems we have, um, I, on the flip side, I don't think the government always consults their own scientists uh, on policy. So if, they, if there's a policy direction, um, I feel like they don't communicate with their own scientists as much either. What was the other question? I do miss being in the field, and I'm not able to be in the field near as much as I, I used to. And, and especially when we made those business units, then that sort of made things run on their own. I'm still heavily involved in all of the research projects in the development stage. I'm always involved in the first year of it as much as I possibly can. And seeding's always my favorite, so I'll go do a little bit of seeding myself. I hate harvest, they can do all that themselves. Thank you. Yeah. That's three Ag Canada scientists in a row. No, four. Four? Fourth, oh, one's, yes. fourth one's coming. So far, it's only three. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm Jim Moyer. Tough um, <laughs> My question is, you talked a lot about uh, conservation tillage and zero tillage. It's all based on that one herbicide, it seems, glyphosate. And you said that in France, they might lose it. Mm -hmm. What is the future in Canada? Are we going to keep it? or? I uh, one farming friend said, I, I asked him, I said, what would you do if you lost glyphosate? He said, I'd quit farming. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know what's the future? Are, are we in trouble here too? Or is there a problem with glyphosate? I don't know about that either. Yeah, we're in trouble. Um, I don't think that politically we've moved in the direction that Europe has yet. But I think we should be seeing it as a warning. I mean, I mentioned in France they don't have neonics. There was a big debate that we were going to lose neonics. And it was for environmental reasons. Um, but this is a seed treatment that protects crops from, from insects. And there was some potential risk in corn that it was hurting water and vertebrates. So they were using that as an argument to get rid of it in all practices blanket across Canada. And, and w w fortunately, we actually won that one. So we haven't moved, I think, politically that way yet. Um, 
Is it going to happen in the near future? I don't think so, Jim, but probably more importantly is that we are already developing glyphosate resistant weeds and kochia is a awful one we're having trouble with right now we could actually use your help if you want to come back we're back into using more residual herbicides and mixtures of different and, and cultural practices this you know with all the droughts that we've had we, we're developing resistance to glyphosate so the, what scares me more is that we're not investing in science to help deal with the real problems we're dealing with because we're so focused on climate change. So I think that's a bigger problem than them just blanketly getting rid of glyphosate. I mean, I was part of a proposal with uh, Bob's replacement to study glyphosate tolerant kochia in lentils and it was not funded. And I'm like, have you been in a field? It's ridiculous. So. That's why I mean there's a big disconnect all around and where where the funding goes and we are we're, we're just giving handouts to farmers now whether they want it or not as an incentive all of these climate change practices you can get money now to grow a cover crop well, we just did a five year study on cover crops we're a desert they don't work here but that's okay we'll pay you to plant them um, and and so so those were regulation is one thing incentives can be I think just as bad. So, uh, yeah, long story. Yes, no. <clears throat> My name's Dave Major, and I, uh, I worked at the research station uh, mainly in uh, climate change and remote sensing. Mm -hmm. And I have <laughs> probably more suggestions than questions, but uh, um, we started out after the war, there was a big effort in Ag Canada in extension. Uh, you guys will remember the old experimental farms and that. And then as the provincial government became more dominant, and they took over the extension rule, and we did uh, work together. Um, when I started in 1974, there were 1,500 uh, research scientists in the research branch in Canada. And my understanding now is that there's probably about 300. So uh, there are definitely big cuts. And a lot of the reason for that is, well, when I started again, I think there were only a handful of agronomists in the city of Lethbridge. But today there are probably hundreds. And they're all employed by private companies. And over my career, I saw a lot of uh, our activities being taken over, uh, or at least in cooperation with industry. So we had matching funds. Uh, for example, one project I had, uh, I took a, a, a transfer of work to, to Denver, and through that work, I generated about $2 million in funds back in the 90s with, a, with private companies, with Boeing and Monsanto and John Deere and those companies. As that work grew, there were more and more pressure on the government to exclude farmers from the research station because they didn't, the private companies wanted to protect their interest in the money that they were given us. So it, in effect, industry bought the research branch and it gradually diminished. And these hundreds of agronomists that are in, working today are all hired by private companies. So that's kind of an evolution of how things have gone. But my big question for you, and, and as a climate scientist, I realize that Scientists, being 97% introverts, are not really the kind of guys that are going to go out and try to sell something to anybody. So we, we've done the work on climate, and I recently published a paper on climate, the effect of climate change on growing corn in the prairies. It was a 50-year update from the, one of my original projects. Um, uh, that what we haven't done is talk back to the public to inform them about 
the, the facts about climate change. Like that science, there's nothing in it for a scientist to get up and, ha and get into an argument with a climate denier. It, it, that's like trying to argue religion. Um, it's facts versus belief. So, but that leads me to a similar situation with what you were talking about, and that is that we've got a, a, a divide between the urban understanding of their food and the guys that are growing it. And it, I would like to ask you why, well, th maybe it's not a question. It's a suggestion. I think you need to educate the 95% urban society on what it is that you're doing. You know, people don't want to eat meat, but as soon as you go west of here, you can't, the only crop you can grow is beef. You can't grow carrots in the foothills, nor would you want to. There's, it's like Ireland. You can't grow anything but beef because the climate just doesn't allow it. So you need to educate the city guys who think that you need to quit eating meat. Well, that's all we can grow. Our biggest crop in southern Alberta is beef. So I don't know if that's a question. Like, are you doing anything to educate the urban population? Mm -hmm. I think there's a general consensus within the industry that we need to have more conversations with the general public. Um, we are participating in, in that open farm days, so we have uh, the opportunity for people to come out and, and visit our, our research farm and it's it's kind of fun actually and it, it's not the same technical conversation that we're used to what's that that's a lentil oh what is a lentil used for okay you guys should put signs up on the road that tells me what crop that is when i drive by but you know it's really simple conversations it's never really anything technical it's never a debate about anything so um the the downside is that Every time I've engaged with the general public, they've been very supportive. And, and I, I think we get our backs up against the wall. I think what I'm becoming more concerned with now is not the urban-rural divide, it's the rural-rural divide. Because we fight amongst each other so much. And kind of like Mark's question is, how can we get together globally? We can't even get together locally. So good luck on that one. And, and I, you know, there are 12 other groups like ours across the province. We fight with half of them. Um, that's human nature. And I think we just have to continue to work with those of us that like to work together and are productive and, and come up with unique ways of, of delivering a relationship, a product, whatever. Um, I definitely am with you though, Dave. And, and you know, the, like you said, you, you can't debate something. It, you, there's no point in debating against somebody that's already made up their mind. And that's often what we hear about in the media. And, and that's, that's one of the big problems. Hi, uh, I'm <clears throat> Trevor Page. I'm not an agricultural scientist. First one, right? <laughs> but you, you mentioned that um, the government seems to have lost touch with farmers, and that's really what my question deals with. And I wondered what you thought you about. I wondered what you thought about the abolition of the Canadian Wheat Board and the effect of that on Canadian farmers and internationally on how that impacts on food availability around the world. Um, talking to uh, some of my uh, friends who are uh, bigger farmers in Alberta, all of their grain seems to go south, sucked up by Cargill and the likes. Uh, Canada seems to have lost its place on the international scene. Um, with climate change, uh, certainly the UN is seriously concerned about sub-Saharan Africa. And I wonder what you thought that Canadian farmers and the government should be doing about that, if anything. Thank you. Thank you for probably the toughest question of the day. Um, just to make a point along your last comment there, that 
That slide in Europe that I saw regarding the, the European Union's approach to climate change, one of the big red flags is that only countries that are rich enough to be able to afford to do this will be successful, but the poor countries are not able, they don't have the luxury of um, to be able to afford to do that. So I do think that there's probably some, some, some issues to deal with on, on climate change policies along that front. As far as the wheat board one, um, most of the farmers that I talk to are pretty happy it's gone. They, they would celebrate that. And it's just, you know, they call it market freedom. They're now able to, to market and get more for their grain uh, than they ever used to. The ones that are disadvantaged are probably further away from the border that have higher transportation costs. And, and I can understand that constraint well too. Like I, you know, you can drive 12 hours north and they're still growing wheat. So, you know, that's why crops like canola have been so important because they actually weigh less and they can get more money in their transportation sort of things. But um, for the most part, I mean, I, I haven't seen that as a, as a negative. I think it's created a lot of marketing opportunity. Maybe what's lost was some of that um, Canadian brand, because now we're reliant on the grain companies to represent for us. But there, are, there is still work being done along that front to, to maintain it. But truthfully, that's pretty far outside of my area of expertise. You can ask Ryan, my chairman back there. He's a farmer. OK. <laughs> Yes, last question here. Oh, Non-scientist here, Barb Phillips. So my question, my parents started kind of like your great-grandparents, uh, 160 acres west of Edmonton for 10 bucks, and life was not very good, but that's okay. Small is kind of sometimes beautiful, though. And my question is, I read that probably within about 10 years, most of the food produced in Canada is going to be from large corporate farms and Hutterite colonies and the little guy is kind of getting squeezed out. The little farmer that I know that grows a whole lot of garlic but just a few acres or like myself I grew five acres of strawberries and I worked my butt off with those five acres. So small is sometimes good. Is this this uh, urge to go to these large corporate farms is that really farming smarter? I don't know. Good question, Barb. Um, I, I think there's a place for, for all farm sizes, but they have to diversify. Growing garlic is a great idea. You can get up to $30,000 an acre for garlic. Um, I have a small farm myself, which is why I'm growing 10 acres of willow. I make more money off my willows that are now grown in my saline low spots that used to be wasteland. So if you can take creative approaches to agriculture, there, there is a way to, to find a business. Um, Truthfully, a lot of the larger farms I find are actually more sustainable than the small ones. And they're run more efficiently, more like a business. They have safety protocols. And so, so I don't honestly think that the perception of the larger farm is really fair and necessarily true. A lot of times these are still family farms. They're just run with a lot more efficiency and a lot more specialization. So I, I I think that one's been overblown, but I do, you know, it is challenging. Farming, I, I tried a market garden for a year too. I'm not into that kind of labor. If the Hutterites want to do it and can do it better, I'm okay with that. Um, so I, I think there's a good place for everybody. Here, you're, leaving, you're letting a few more in here? Okay. Hi, uh, it's Ian Hurdle. Uh, you had a great intro there about drip irrigation. I wondered if you could expand on that. Sure. So, I bought some land from my grandparents that were sliced up by the irrigation canal and um, so, so they're irregular shaped fields and irrigated land in southern Alberta is incredibly expensive and what uh, when I went to price out pivots those are the you know the big ones that go around in circles well I have a 110 acre piece 
and I can only get 80 acres of it covered with a full quarter section pivot. So I wanted to find another way of, of looking at a different approach. And there was a company in town here that was sort of offering this idea of subsurface drip irrigation. This is a technology that's mostly developed in Israel. It's used in California where they're, they actually have water restrictions. So there's only a certain limited amount of water. So it's a very efficient system. Um, and we don't have that constraint here yet in Alberta. We, we don't meter our water. Um, we're given an allocation on a yearly basis. But so I, and I'm, I like trying new things. So, you know, my farm is, is now that's how I get out in the field is my own farm instead of at work and just decided to work with the company. We gave it a try. I've got 130 acres now of subsurface drip. It's buried about 10 inches below the ground and it has little pressure compensated emitters and I feed the crop that way. Um, it's been pretty good. And then the other thing is, is I get the full 110 acres so I can, I can fit irregular shaped pieces of land. The biggest downfall has been mice. They are eating my drip tape and I have to fix it every year. So it's a pretty high maintenance uh, effort, but um, it's a lot better than wheel lines. Yeah. Hello, my name is Knut Peterson, and uh, my question is related to uh, what, is, what is farm life like? How does farmers uh, go day to day? Uh, I think the days of AAA farmers are long gone. Anybody that knows uh, anything about farming back in the 60s and 70s, they used to call the dryland farmers, AAA farmers, which meant uh, April, August in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but those days, I think, are, are largely gone now. Farmers are working pretty hard year round. Uh, I wonder if uh, Ken could expand a little bit upon what uh, life is like as a farmer. Well, I'm only a fake farmer, but I can tell you what I've seen with others. Um, I do think that farmers um, have transitioned from farmers to farm managers. And, you know, it's just the same transition that I went through my own job is you go from, you know, just focused on the tasks to get the crops in and harvested to managing a business, to managing staff. So I think there has been a pretty big change in, in the lifestyle. And in, in a lot of cases, farmers are forced to do things that they never used to have to. So um, it's probably some, but at the same time, they can specialize now if they want. But one of the things that it was fun is that you used to be able to do everything. And, and it was a little less complicated. So I, I, I think it's, it's a stressful job, and I think that there are, are challenges, but they've had to adapt to a different lifestyle. I do think that some of them are still able to go to Arizona from time to time, and you know, I think it still, it still happens, and you go on holidays and try to find the right work-life balance, but there is a growing issue with mental health in agriculture, too, that's being talked about a lot more now, too. We're all done? Yeah. Okay. Do a um, I really applaud the fact that you guys create a stage for discussion and whenever we do this for agriculture is actually we're partnered with the college a lot and um, I'd like to have more opportunities to discuss agricultural issues so we may borrow your model and try to engage or work with you as well because I you know I know everybody a lot of people are passionate about ag um, back in the day if you wanted to attract me to a policy discussion I would have run for the hills and I think that's part of what we need to change. We need, to, and farmers themselves, we need to find ways to engage with the, the ag industry and with the local community to, to discuss and, and learn more about each other. It does affect each other. Um, and so I think this is a great venue for that and appreciate you guys in inviting me. And I want to say hi to well, another professor. I think you taught me stats in my first year of university. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Ken Coles. Thank you everyone for having me here as a moderator. Um, just to let you know what next week's topic is, it's about Treaty 7 and what are the impacts from a Blackfoot perspective with your speaker, Dr. Mike Brewsthead. So come out next week for that, same time, same place. And thank you again. Have a good day.